what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTTV. Surprise. <laughs> okay, we are live now, Jenna. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm helping Jenna with her first live Q and A. Um, I'm gonna help her keep track of all the comments and look in the live chat for non super chat questions. So let me just start out by asking everyone in the live chat if you want to ask a question and it's not a super chat because uh, um, Streamyard automatically stars all the super chats, so I don't have to go looking for those. But I do have to go looking for questions that aren't super chats. So please begin your question with capital caps question, and it'll help me find it in the stream. And um, we're doing this exclusively on Jenna's channel right now because I want her to see what this would be like um, if she's just doing it, um, you know, numbers wise, viewers wise, all that kind of stuff. Um, if she's just doing a stream on her channel by herself and not streaming with someone else at the same time. So how are you feeling this morning? Good, not bad, nervous again, but I know it will be fine. <laughs> Good, good, good. Um, get any interesting feedback from uh, the interview we did last week, by any chance? Um, I just got a lot of really um, sweet comments um, from people that were just so nice. Like, it, yeah, it was so sweet to hear some of those things. So thank you, everybody. Awesome. Um, anyone you have in mind to possibly uh, do, uh, who want to do uh, interviews with you on your channel? Any, any people like pop up that you hadn't heard from in a while who'd be like, oh man, I want to do a chat with you or something like that? Yeah, a few people, definitely. Yeah, I was talking to Laura last week. So I definitely, we were both at the Int Ranch. So I definitely would want to talk to her. Awesome. Um, all right. So let's see. If we go, if we, if we plan on going for about two hours, do you have that? Do you have two hours that we could do this? Mm hmm. Sweet. All right, so let's see. Um, Uber Nubage, uh, Uber Nubage says, "Wait, I got it. There we go. Thank you for joining SPTV and for speaking out." Oh, well, how? Thank you. When you did your book, Jenna, was the press that you did for your book the first time um, you were a fit, quote unquote speaking out, or had you already done some media appearances before the book was even a thing? Um, I had done a few others. Um, the first time I spoke out was when it was actually when um, that Tom Cruise biography came out and it was like written by Andrew Morton and it had like a lot in there about Scientology. And then um, Scientology wrote this like whole long speech about how they're like so great. They love family. It's the most important thing to them. And at the time it was like, I was right in the thick of like, Scientology trying to get um, go through like um, my husband at the time's parents like harassing us every day to go back into Scientology and um, so it was just so frustrating to hear them say that and lie so openly and so I just like I had to say something like it was such a lie um, so I like wrote like an open letter to the girl in Scientology who had written that whole rebuttal to his book. Who was that? Do you remember? It was Karen Powell. Oh, it was Karen Powell. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and she was just doing it as like an Osa mouthpiece, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Huh. And uh, where did you publish that letter? Was that on the ex Scientology kids website? I actually think at the time it was on Operation Clambake because I, the ex Scientology Kids website didn't exist. We hadn't done that yet. Yeah, so I think it was like at the beginning, either of two thousand and six or two thousand and seven. Wow, that's amazing. Did the ex Scientology Kids website come up um, before or after uh, your book and the media that you did surrounding your book? Definitely before, a long time before. Like, oh wow! Okay. Yeah, like, I guess, like, maybe it was 2008 or 2007 even. Um, and my book came out in 2013. Wow. Yeah, um, so it was a long time before. <clears throat> Someone had asked me a question to ask you about whether... 
Oh my God. I'm going to forget the story and I'm going to forget the name. Someone. Oh, Johnny Lewis. Did Johnny Lewis ever send um, you or the two other women that started that website with you? Just remind me, Astra Woodcraft and the other girl's name was Kendra Wiseman. Kendra Wiseman. Oh, we said Wilkinson last time. I Kendra, know. So Kendra. <laughs> wasn't Kendra Wilkinson like the the uh, the playmate? Girl? Yes, totally. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed by that. Did Johnny Lewis ever send you guys some type of story to publish on that website about growing up in Scientology? I don't know. That you were called. I don't remember. That he, I uh, he told somebody that he did, and he actually got in a lot of trouble with Scientology for doing it. I think it might have been Kendra because I think she may have mentioned something to me at the time, but I was just so like carried away with other things. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm glad I remembered to ask you that because I told someone that I would. Um, Sorry, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Uh, Steve Britton, a snooper chat for the benefit of OSA. You get to do laundry out here too. Thank you, Steve. Um, Pat Shore, question. If you had a chance to stand in front of your uncle, Uncle Lil Captain David Miscavige, and ask one question, what would it be? Um, I don't know. Maybe I would just like ask him directly if he even believes in Scientology at all. What do you suspect is the answer to that question from just from your experience? What do you think? Does he seem... Does he seem to believe? Because I, cause I've always like, in some ways he really seems to, and in other ways he he really seems not to. Where do you come down on that? It seems impossible to me that he does. Huh. Like, and and why do you say yeah. that? Um. Well, because there's so like he knew everything obviously that was happening with L. Ron Hubbard before he died, yeah. and so like, you know, why would he feel the need to lie about that if he like really believed in Scientology. Like he would have maybe made up some Scientology explanation for it. And just, I feel a bit like, I mean, not a, like every, you know, year there's like the golden age of tech, the golden age of something else. Like everything is changing all the time. So, and just in my experience, like we talked about in um, the last time we talked, like RTC is just like, doesn't pay attention to policy at all. So I don't know. I, I don't see, like, to be honest, he seems too smart to believe in that. Wow. You know, when you mentioned that in our last chat, that in your experience, RTC seemed to care about the tech or the purity of the tech or keeping Scientology working less than anyone else you knew in the Sea Org. I'd never heard anybody say that before. It was really interesting to consider mm. that. Because it almost seems like that they consider themselves above the law. Like that's how I sort of interpret it. That that if they were to yeah. take any liberties with it, it's because the rules were for the plebes and they were above the rules. Right. Yeah. And I, I never really connected that dot with not care. I just never really connected those dots. But it was interesting to consider. Yeah. I remember when I was there, like because sometimes they would just like randomly take me off my post and I don't know, put me on like doing like heavy labor or put me in the bathroom, whatever, like we talked about, but um, like any other person would have gotten a committee of evidence done on them in order to do that. And I would even ask for that when it happened, just so that it wasn't just one person making the decision and they would always be like, no, no, no. So. That's right. That's right. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to bring that up right now. I'm just meant to star that one. Um, it's okay. Uh, because, and, and, and also <clears throat> I'm just thinking about things that just didn't quite occur to me at the time, the significance of these things. It was very obvious being in the Sea Org at PAC on L. Ron Hubbard way mm -hmm. that people who were kicked out of int were always done so without standard justice, without mm. standard commabs or anything. It was just basically a miscavige would be like, get the hell out of here. I don't want to see you again. And overnight the guy's gone, which right. isn't how Scientology justice is supposed to work and these guys were always so i want to call them crusty they weren't good sea org members because they were so mm -hmm. angry and bitter they didn't really respect authority well because they no longer had respect for the authority because they no longer had the trust that authority was doing things correctly they were you know what i mean like they weren't they weren't what someone like me at that time would consider good sea org members and right. i th i think it's because they were like dude we've seen what it's like at the top 
and yeah maybe yeah I feel like worse they than also that. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and I feel like they like went out of their way to put them in degrading positions in a way to like just like make them feel like shit about themselves like they were always like making all the people who came down from in into like a cleaner or not that any of those things are bad, but it was like, it was intentional, like a cleaner or like a worker in the galley or something like that. Yeah. There was some guy I'm going to Ken Mortensen. He used to be like quality exec int or something. And he was mm -hmm. banished to the folder archives in the basement of AOLA with some order that, you know, he could never hold an executive post ever again. Yeah. And, I remember thinking, why do you have to be so horrible to right. people? He was the best. He was the best folder admin in the history of the Sea Org. He took a lot of pride in his job, but <laughs> but it's like like you said, like they really seem to go out of the way to degrade people who used to work at the Int Base. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, Sea Org tech discussion says, Jenna, were you on the ship in two thousand four? Two thousand four? No, I wasn't. I only went to the ship once and it was when um, we visited one time from the ranch. Like all the kids went to the ranch. I mean, went to the ship. It was like in Ensenada and that's the only the time ship, I've been there. The ship was in Ensenada? Yeah. Like it was like docked there for some reason. And we all like went down there as like a field trip and like were there, spent the whole day there. They took a whole bunch of little kids across the border in New Mexico. Yeah, I guess so. I didn't really think about that at the time. But. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea the ship had ever been in Ensenada. Was it like getting dry dock repairs or something? I don't know. I was so young. I was just like, yay, the ship, because my mom had built the ship. Like she was responsible for the renovations. So I was like excited to finally see it. But I was only like nine or something. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, Trevanon says, is the ex Scientology kids email address operational? You were talking about that last time. Jenna at ex Scientology kids .com is operational. I've had a few emails there. Nice. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Jolene Harris says, I have heard SPTV hosts theorize that Shelly will succeed, David. Do you think she could save Scientology? Before you answer this, I want to amend the question. Um, uh, Joylene, I mean, I guess any question is a fair question. I've never heard anybody say Shelly will succeed, David. Um, I have said, and partially because Mike Rinder has said, because people ask all the time, if Dave were to die tomorrow, who would take over Scientology? Nobody really knows. But Mike Rinder has pointed out that one of the only people left at Int in Management who, who has as much, well, first of all, who has a history of working with L. Ron Hubbard, right? and who has the respect of other executives probably more so than anyone else would be Shelly and that it, it's just one of the most likely scenarios but but I just wanted to say no one said that's what would happen it's just been theorized that it's one of the answers that makes the most sense um, mm -hmm. have you ever heard us talk about that in any of our chats and whatnot um, I haven't I've heard other people I've heard people talk about it in general What? so what do you think about that um, that Shelly will succeed, David. I don't think that she will like, just because she's like in trouble, obviously, wherever she is. And so I think it would probably be whoever would fight to the top, like Dave did, whoever was the most aggressive. And I don't think that would be her. But I do think that she would have a lot of clout and people would listen to her. Right. But yeah. Do I, I think, think I think that fact it's because because it's kind of like how ha, because ha, there's no there's no rule about who takes over. So like, how would that decision be made? It does kind of come down to the fact of, well, who will people listen to? Right. And do you think Shelly is at least one of those people that those who are left would listen to? I definitely think that people would listen to her and her uh, what she would say uh, would be valued but she doesn't have the power that Dave has, like in her personality. She's not like uh, somebody who would make herself a leader, I don't think. Hmm. She doesn't have like that presence about her that people will like a uh, dominant presence that would make people like 
follow her in that way. That's not like she doesn't have that personality at all. Is there anyone else up there that you think um, tops that list for you? Who you think would probably win that power struggle? Gosh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I even think like somebody like Ann Raspin or Jenny Linson would be more likely to be more aggressive in something like that. Although I don't know that they would, but um, yeah, that they would you know, be more likely. <clears throat> it, it does seem to me that someone like a Jenny would probably be one who would like fight hardest to get to the top of that dog pile. Um, I think if I recall correctly, one of the reasons Mike completely discounts someone like a Jenny is that Jenny doesn't know the lawyers. Jenny doesn't know the accountants. Jenny doesn't like, it, it seems to me that Miss Gavage probably would have kept Jenny out of the loop on a lot of that important stuff. Whereas maybe Shelly, would be familiar to those people because that's the other thing how do the lawyers know who they're supposed to listen to now hmm. they, they right. can, they're, they're going to be most likely to listen to someone that they know um yeah that's true yeah so no one really knows right it's all just we don't yeah. even know who the hell's still there for, for all we know some of these execs could be <laughs> like you know off in australia I now know. Or <laughs> yeah i guess that's where they send send everyone is australia I don't know why. That's kind of rude to Australia. <laughs> I wonder if they started doing a similar thing with Africa now that there's a Sea Org base in Africa, you know? Well, when I was, like, before I left, they tried to send me to Australia and Africa. They also tried to send me to Africa. But but they did send you to, uh, to Canberra, Australia for, like, yeah. a year, right? Yeah, yeah. The best that thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Was that before or after they tried to send you to Africa? Um, they tried to send me to Africa after that. But um, when, when we came back, they wanted to send us to Africa. But, um, but in those documents that we talked about last week, you know, the ones that um, they um, like, there was like this whole write up that was like, if I hadn't, if I didn't leave, if I managed to stay in the Sea Org, if they could like convince me, they wanted to send me to Australia to be um, an estate cleaner. That's what it said specifically? <laughs> yes, specifically. Oh my goodness. Who did it? Do you remember who the dispatch came from? Like who's, whose idea was it? Um, I don't know whose idea it was. It, I mean, it was probably either Kirsten Catano from OSA or Mike. Yeah. But I don't know if it was his idea or what. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Let's see here. Going down the list. Here's one. What are Jenna's metaphysical views these days? I guess this is asking about like life after death, God, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, I like with respect to everybody. I like have so many like kind people in my life from different religions. I am not religious. I don't believe in God. Sorry. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just think that we are like, I'm my body and whatever is happening in my mind is that's who I am. But yeah, I'm not like an atheist who's like, all religion is stupid. And I just, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe in it, but I respect everybody and I respect everybody's beliefs. There you go. Betsy Sue says, thank you for your bravery and for joining SPTV. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Lori plays Jenna queen of the can stomp. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the emitter can. Uh, how are you feeling about this new YouTube opportunity? We are excited to have you join us. Thank you. I'm feeling good about it. I'm still figuring out like what direction I'm going to take everything in and um, who I want, who, who I would like to join me to help tell their stories and in what format. So I'm kind of taking it slow um, so I can make sure that I do something that I feel proud of and that does people justice. So that's why I'm not rushing and making a ton of content. 
Awesome. Very cool. Uh, Keela says, I just finished your book. I'm very proud of your strength. Do you feel vindicated now that there are so many people speaking out? And does that help you find more courage? Oh, thank you so much for reading my book. <laughs> um, I do feel like that. Yeah, it, it does help a lot to hear other people come out and corroborate your stories because, you know, uh, at the beginning, it felt it, it felt like just kind of like alone, not alone. There was always people, but everyone was just being so beaten down and like terrorized. So it was really scary. I never was alone. There was always like a online community, but just now that it's more in the forefront and it's um, like people take these stories seriously, it feels, it feels really good. Does it feel different um, having forums like, um, how do I want to phrase this question? Like when you first started speaking out, you mentioned you, you wrote, you, you published the open letter that you referenced earlier on like um, the Clambake website. So mm -hmm. many of the forums, not, not just so many, but all of them back then, because YouTube wasn't even like a big, big thing back then. If it, I don't remember when YouTube actually started, but um, me neither. But so many of the places where former Scientologists gather and stories get told, it's all written written word on a page or written word on a screen. Does it feel different having a community where people are, you know, interacting like live or, you know, in, in real life? I mean, does it feel different having the conversations now than it did previously? Definitely for sure. And for the better, because I mean, I did so many interviews over the years that were just like, like just all of it kind of was a race and it was like wound up being like one comment about Tom Cruise that like was an answer to their question, you know, so it, and like taken as like a sound bite. So I think that it's um, having YouTube humanizes people. It's not just a written story. You can see the person who's talking. You can see if, you know, if they, if they seem like they're telling the truth and um, I think, and it can be long form not just like a few bites between, I don't know, like five other stories or whatever. So I think it's much better. Yeah. I think it's so much harder for the church to paint people who are speaking out as these evil, dastardly, you know, civilization destroying SPs. If you can just see them with your own eyes and hear them and be like, uh, uh, it's just, it's just a normal ass person. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Totally. And it's even more discrediting when you can take something they've like said about you and like tell the real story. It like kind of like just shows like how they will just like literally make up anything and take it to a psychotic degree. Yeah. Have they ever, I, I feel like we asked this last time, but I can't remember. Have they ever tried to put up one of these hate websites on you or was, was your book before they were even doing things like that? They were doing that when my book came out, but I don't think that I have one. I haven't looked in the last week. <laughs> so, I don't yeah. think you do either. I don't remember seeing anything. And I'm trying to remember though, like, cause my first thought would be, Oh, well they, they wouldn't dare do that to a Miscavige, but I'm thinking, did they do that to Ron senior? Did they do that? Do you remember seeing a website on, on your granddad? Yeah, I know they did that with him. I don't know why. Um, yeah. I we'll don't know see. why. I don't think they will. I don't think they have the balls to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Matt Elliott asks, are you still in contact with the others you did the website with? Um, I don't like talk to them all the time. So it has been a while, but I still love them and consider them amazing and um, would cool. hang out with them anytime. Yeah. Cool. Um, Chloe says, um, how long and what was your process for writing your book? Um, so it was actually quite a quick process, I think, because they were worried that like, um, like that Scientology would do something like crazy. So they just wanted it like while it was being written. So, um, basically I just, um, wrote it by myself, like got everything out stream of consciousness and um, wrote everything down and 
just like took time to remember everything that had happened. And it was actually really cool because I remembered a lot of things that, um, that just like helped me to make sense of why I did certain things or why I felt a certain way. And, um, I was able to talk to some of the people who were mentioned in my book and, and then, um, once I did that right through, I worked with Lisa Pulitzer and an editor at Harper Collins. And we just like went through it chapter by chapter and edited it and took out extraneous things. And, um, you know, like just like made sure each chapter had a point and, um, yeah. And just passed through it several times until it was done. How long did the whole process take? Um, it was about, let's see, it was like five or six months. Holy shit. That's fast. Yeah. That's fast for a book. Wow. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Uh, the Rafa Daffa do says when Jesse Prince first got to the end base, he said they were doing everything but Scientology tech there. Complete madhouse been going on forever. That's interesting, right? Cause for that to be the case, it, it had to sort of be the culture. And I wonder, it makes me wonder if that was the culture under L. Ron Hubbard and maybe if people explained it away because he's always experimenting with this or experimenting with that. Like, like I wonder if the people who are closest to Hubbard would be like, yeah, he didn't really follow his own tech and policy either, but we always had, ex you know, I, I don't know that I've ever even asked someone like Janice that question. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I mean, he was making it up as he went along, so <laughs> why not? I mean, I guess he could do anything and say that was the tech. <laughs> That's right. He could just say it's a re we're doing a pilot. We're doing a pilot, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Miscavige's excuse for everything. We're doing a pilot, a 15 year pilot on quickie grades. <laughs> uh, Jackson in the chat says hey. all the all the int crew went to the ship to experience it. And the ship crew came to the base to see it. Oh, I've never heard that. that before. Yeah. I didn't know that the ship crew came to the int base. I didn't remember that. Yeah, because those qualifications are totally different, right? Yeah. And you have to have like year or not years, like hours of security checking, clearances, and all this stuff to go mm. to the int base. Amazing. All right. Sean says, Jenna, how often did you actually see uh, David Miscavige in person in the later years of your Scientology life, say in the last five years or so? So I'm, I'm guessing it's like the last five years or so that you were in the Sea Org is what I'm going to guess this refers right. to. Right. Um, great videos, Aaron. And I'm glad you're both out of that craziness. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. How often did you see uh, Davey? Um, a lot less often the last five years I was there. Um. I mean, I would say like less than 10 times. Definitely saw him a lot more before that when I was at Flag. But in 2000, I went to, like at the end of 2000, I went to middle management like we talked about. And he wasn't there very often. So when you were at Flag, would he seek you out or would you just run into him in the normal course? I would run into him, but Shelly would seek me out and then he was always there. So Shelly would always seek me out and I would always get called into her office for hours whenever she was there. Oh, well, that brings up an interesting question considering um, the, the Sea Org members at Flag and at the West Coast building act like they've never heard of David Miscavige and he doesn't have any offices there. Where was Shelly's office that she would call you in to see her? It was in the West Coast building on the third floor. And there was like one half of it that was for RTC and Dave's office was at the very end. And then the other half was CMO, uh, CW. So it's like a, just another management or of management organizations. There's like managing managers, manage managers, manage managers, like endless fucking bureaucratic <laughs> bullshit. Um, but yeah, it was in the WB. And the third floor, is that the, 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 Uppermost floor? Mm hmm Yeah. And when you say Miscavige's office was at the end, would that be the end closest to the street or furthest away from the street? Um, closest. Closest to Fort Harrison Avenue? 
Because the bu Sorry. the building only borders with the street on one side. If you know, what I you know. Mean. I'm just thinking, like it was the parking lot. Yeah, it would have been closest to the street. So the parking lot, like you have the street, and then you have like the the building, and then the parking lot is on one side. So yeah. did it? <clears throat> so his windows faced out the sides of the building. I don't. His window would have been closest to the street. To but Fort Harrison. Know. Yeah, but I don't. Was that part of? Was that? Was it only called Fort Harrison in front of the Fort Harrison, and then it was like Cleveland. Farther so up? the actually or the West Cleveland Coast is by the CB. The the um, you're right. Cleveland and Fort Harrison is where the Clearwater Building is, and okay. Drew and Fort Harrison is where the West Coast Building is. Oh, okay. So the parking lot of the West Coast Building extends all the way the to Dr extends all the way to Drew. Okay. Yeah. And that goes to the sand castle. So David Miscavige's personal professional, like his chairman of the board, RTC office was on the third floor of the West coast building. Yeah. You hear that process servers. <laughs> <laughs> now I do believe with the flag building opening up, he has enough, he has, um, he has, uh, I'm trying to picture it on a map right now. The mm. Northwest corner, the tower on the Northwest corner is also mm. his office, but um, uh -huh. I can't say for sure whether he still has the office in the West Coast building. Oh, um, I see. Okay. The flag building wasn't built when I was there. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. David Ricci. Oh, boy. Look at this. First super chat ever. Hello from Missoula. Hello. That's where I was born, Jenna. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> let's do an SP meetup at a brewery when you come back to visit. Keep up the good work. That sounds like a lot of fun. There's some great breweries up in Montana. All right, let's see. John, Sist John Sistovsky wants to know, do you know who Mr. Bill is? No. <laughs> Mr. Bill is that character in the, in the, in the photo. It's an, oh. old, it's an old Saturday Night oh. Live skit. Oh, okay. <laughs> John, John sent me a Mr. Bill doll. Oh. <laughs> oh <that> <laughs> uh, thank you, John. Um, F... Shopes or FS Hopes, but I'm going with F Shopes. Was going on Pierce Morgan the highlight of your life? <laughs> uh, it was like scary. He was nice, but he um like he like pulled out a whopper of a question like live. So I was just like uh wasn't sure what to say. But. What was the question? It was if I thought that Dave was evil. <laughs> That's what he asked you? Yeah. Do you remember what you said? I said, yes, I said that he was, but I needed to think about it more before I answered. I mean, I don't think every, anybody is all evil. I think that people, um, I think that otherwise people wouldn't follow them if that was the case. So I think that people are both. And that's why that's how people get caught up in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It sure does seem that um, just from all the stories, it does seem that he enjoys degrading people. Did you ever see yeah. that firsthand? Yeah, I did see it. Like just like when he would yell at people or just like, I mean, I even remember one time he walked into an office when I was at the West coast building and he went in to talk to somebody. And then this guy was also in the office and he was like making a copy in the copy machine. And then he didn't leave the room and Dave like, just like went psychotic because this person didn't leave when he came in and he just like that, he got, that guy got sent to the RPF. Like he got yelled at. It was just like crazy. He like, yeah, you know, so I've seen like I've even seen him yell at Mark Headley or he was about to when I was like taken out of the room so that he could do that because I was young at the time. But definitely I have. He didn't do it too much in front of me when I was really young. But yeah, I've just seen like little examples of it. Um, back to Pierce Morgan real quick. Did you already know who he was like when you were going on the show? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, okay. I wondered if you have if like if someone just has absolutely no idea that the person they're about to speak with is kind of a big deal. Um, if maybe it makes it easier or something. Was there any of these shows that you went on where it it wasn't a big deal to you because you just had no idea who they were, even though they were kind of a big deal? Um, I think I knew who everyone was mostly. Yeah, yeah I mean, I was like. By the time I was on those shows, I had been out of Scientology for like eight years. Mm. So I, I wasn't. When you went on The View, was Barbara Walters there? No, she wasn't. It was Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg and um, Sherry Shepard, I think. I won't remember the other names, but Whoopi was there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Cool. All right. Tin Tin says, amazing. Uh, and other another hero joins SPTV. Thank you, Jenna and Aaron. Thank you. It's very kind. Free Zenu Project. Jenna, I read your book and loved it. I have a hardcover. Are you going to be selling signed copies of your book? Oh, thank you for reading my book. Um, I don't know. I hadn't planned to. Maybe. We'll see. Why not? <laughs> yeah, definitely a good idea. Definitely a good idea. Um, <clears throat> Pat Shore, I love the flowers drying in the background. Do you use them in art? Oh, um, yeah, well, I guess I use them to make arrangements. I had, I've, um, had my own, like I, my own business where I would grow flowers and sell them to local shops and also like make my own arrangements and like make the pottery for the vases that they're in. Um, so, and I, usually sell the dried flowers in the winter too. So the flower shops can make um, the wreaths and stuff. Awesome. Uh, do you still do that? I still do a little bit of it. Like at the moment I'm trying to get into software development. So I do a little bit though. I still sell to a few shops and um, a few florists. Very cool. Nice. Uh, Kate Eliza or Eliza, Kate Eliza, I'm late, but here. So happy that you're doing this channel, Jenna. You're so strong, brave, and beautiful. I cannot wait to see where you go on this platform. Oh, thank you. Um, Raf says, from the Italian twins, Raphael and David, we think it will be a good idea to organize a gathering of all of us who survived Scientology. Every now, yeah, every now and then something like, like that occurs. Um, I got to be honest. I, I don't find those things particularly appealing. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Kind of like, just because we're all in Scientology doesn't mean we all want to hang out. Like, uh, on, and honestly, it's one of the things that I like about YouTube is like you can hang out with whoever you want, whenever you want. We don't have to all fly to one location. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little jaded on the idea. I got to be honest. I've never been to one. So I don't, I haven't, I don't, I don't have the experience to be jaded about it yet. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I mean, it's like there's also an assumption that because we all have, uh, you know, some shared experience that we all like each other or get along. And that's certainly not true. That's true. That is very true. That's a <laughs> good know. point. Yeah. Maybe um, like in your local area. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. Uh, not to shit on the idea, Raph. I mean, I, I do understand why people say that. And, and you know, people have, have said we should go on a big SP cruise. And, and the okay. funny thing is, for the last many years, we've sort of been doing that. <laughs> like wow. at, at least once a year. I'm, and I think it started oh, out. I, well, I, well, 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 it started out with um, the Grady's um, Janice and um, uh, Janice and her family and their father would, they'd organize a big cruise. And, and over the years, more and more people would go on these cruises and the Headley started going and then we started going and then the Rinders started going and then um, some other people started going. And, and for the last five or six years, we've kind of gone on one of these things at least once a year. Oh, um, okay. I didn't know. I think I heard of one years back, but I never got invited. <laughs> that's a damn shame. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Well, you sort of disappeared. I, I mean, I genuinely was under the impression that you were sort of intentionally staying away from everybody. Like, I, I don't even it's not even that anyone told that to me. And but oh, but I did mention to you, I did. I was told that you had this lifetime. Um, what, what is the name of those? What, what is the name of the lifetime story? Lifetime movie. original. What, what was oh, it? Okay. What lifetime movie, Lifetime original. I don't know. Either one. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And other than that, I guess I just assumed if you wanted to be around, you'd be around. Were you intentionally laying low or were you just like living your life? 
Um, I don't know. I guess <clears throat> it was both intentional and I just felt like that's what I had to do for my life to be okay. Like I, like, I just don't feel that, um, within my family situation that I was like supported for doing that mm. from Dallas's immediate family, my husband's immediate family. And it was just like, I had gone through years of arguing when we were trying to get, they were trying to have us be back in Scientology that I was just exhausted from it. Like I, I had two babies and I just like couldn't go through the arguing or the shadiness or the belittling anymore. So I think I did just not intentionally, but sort of just like organically just wound up withdrawing from it. That makes sense. You know, who did come on the, those cruises, at least the last one that I can remember um, before he passed was your grandfather, Ron, Ron senior. And that that's right. Up that's what I remember. That's the one I remember hearing about. Uh, and that just brings up this question that was in the queue. Were you close with your grandfather, Ron? I don't think I've ever really mm -hmm. asked you that. Yeah. Um, I, we weren't very close. No, I was closer with my grandma um, and they were not together. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was like around and he was like very like outgoing and like gregarious, but we didn't really have that close of a relationship. And um, so Ron, well, Ron Sr., your grandfather, he mm -hmm. did join the Sea Org at one point. But your grandmother, Loretta, did she never join the Sea Org? Yeah, she never joined. I th they got divorced at that time. Oh. When he joined. And yet you ended up closer to Loretta. How did that happen? Um, because when I was in Florida, she was there as a public. And so, like, if I ever had a day off, then I would spend it with her. And she just like always made a huge effort. In fairness to my grandpa, he did as well, or his wife Becky did. But it just like, it, I don't know, like just me and my grandma got along really well. She was really funny. And um, I just like loved being around her. She was really warm. And it, it felt like family when I was with her. Um, so, and then I guess it was when I was a little bit um, older when I was around her, where not so much with him. So I would have more memories of it. And I don't know, she just always went out of her way to make me feel loved and um, special and always tried to include me in everything. And um, yeah, I really loved her a lot. That's really nice. I, I can't believe I, I never even knew she existed. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm so oh. weirded out by that. Oh, like, she would be on course at the coachman. Like she was on the St. Hill special briefing course for like ever. Wow. Incredible. Okay. Auntie Harju, no question. Just thanks for existing, Jenna. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so you nice. for existing. <laughs> is that a euro? Is that the symbol for a euro? I think it is. Oh, yeah. I think I it know. is. Uh, right. Destiny Salazar says, Jenna, off topic, I'm so jealous of your workspace behind you. Is that crafting storage? Thank you for your courage. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, those drawers, there's a whole mess inside of them. I can never open them or close them. But yeah, just like all of my floristry stuff and other crafting stuff. Nice. All right, Selma Van. Oh my God, how do you say that name? Sleitenhorst? Sleitenhorst? Sleitenhorst. Sleitenhorst. It's, that's got to be Afrikaans, right? Or or Dutch? Yeah, maybe. Uh, my first ever super chat. Just to say thank you for everything. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so sweet. Um, okay, Julie Denny. It's so nice to see you on YouTube, Jenna. Your contribution to your channel and to SPTV is so very important. I read your book when it came out and finally understood what Scientology is about. Best wishes to you. Oh, thank you so much. That means Very a lot nice. to me. Oh, I like this next question. Um, Jenna, do you think ex Scientology message board redux? I don't know if the right way to say that is redux or redo. I, I think it means like they've relaunched the ex Scientology message board. I think this is 
I think this is what it's talking about. Do you think ex Scientology message board redu uh, and the old board is too hostile or scary a place for second or third generation Scientology kids? To be honest, I actually don't know. Like I started working on going through it and where I want to take the site and go through everything. So I actually have not been doing that for years and I need to look at everything and just see what the best way to move forward with it is. So I'll look at it and I'll see. Or, but back in the day, um, you mentioned oh. you published this open letter on, on, um, uh, is ESMB and Clambake the same thing? I've never been truly clear on that. Do you know? I think so. But okay. so other than posting that open letter on that forum, were you active in that forum? A little bit. Yeah. I didn't think it was hostile, but I think that the ex Scientology kids forums were even less hostile. Like everybody seemed like pretty chill and nice to each other and respectful. So there were some issues on Clambake for sure. Um, but I, oh, I, I think I understand the question. Like maybe they're talking about like that Clambake environment. And is it, I actually think that it's really nice that um, like second and third generation Scientologists have their own space. And there's also children of Scientology, um, which is a really good place um, for them to go. But it's nice that they have their own space because sometimes, you know, if they're mixed in with first generation Scientologists, it can become a little bit um, contentious because the kids are like, why the fuck did he bring me into this? And then, you know, maybe the first generation ones are like, what are you complaining about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, th I'm guessing this question might be coming from the fact that I I've told a story many, many times that, um, there was a two, two year period of my life when I moved to LA when I was 17, uh, until I was, uh, just before I turned 18 and, and, and anyway, for two years I lived in LA and okay. had left, had left staff, blown staff basically. Uh, and me and my brother moved to Hollywood and, and for two years we had nothing to do with Scientology. Mm -hmm. Um, and at one point in time during that period, I was working at a coffee shop on Hollywood and Vine called Cyber Java. And mm -hmm. it was like one of the early internet cafes. And that was my first real uh, introduction and exploration of the internet. Mm -hmm. And I remember going on to um, ESMB or Clam Bake. I, I still don't know if they're one and the same. And, and again, and, and, the, and I've said it was, it was too... It was too over the top for me at the time. Like I still consider myself a Scientologist. Right, right. And I saw things being discussed in a way that at least from my perspective at that time was like, oh, come on. This is like just being done for the creation of an effect. It's exaggerated. It's hyperbolic. It's, it's over the top. And the truth is, to be honest, those stories could have been perfectly true and they were just beyond what I was willing to believe. Yeah. Um, but the totally. way- I can to that the way things were being discussed was just so derogatory that I was kind of like, Oh, just a bunch of disgruntled SPs. That's um, mm. kind of what I expected, but yeah. And I stayed in Scientology for 15 more years. Hmm. That's um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see that there was, when I first saw it, there was a lot of um, like OT3 information and I was like too afraid to read it. So I wouldn't, but actually by the time I had looked at it, I think that blown for good was already on it. So it was more directly relatable to my experience, but I will say that on X Scientology kids, um, Kendra put together a lot of questions that were like, Hey, read here. If you don't want to look at the OT three materials, if you're too scared, you know, so it's actually targeted directly to help people who maybe would have been in in your situation, how you were feeling at the time, very like friendly and like, Hey, I know you think you're the only one who you might think you're the only one who's feeling this way, but you're not. There's actually a bunch of us who grew up. So just like, um, just like a bunch of questions and answers that are really directly targeted to that type of person. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I did a chat. I've done a couple chats so far. Um, with uh, Jason Havardic in Australia, um, former, mm. uh, you know, second gen Scientologist. And one of the things he said is that he wishes that I wouldn't talk about Xenu or joke about Xenu so much because he thinks it will turn off people who are just maybe watching my videos for the first time. 
What do you think about that? Um, I mean, I think it's a good point, but I think that there has to be a balance of you letting off steam of something that's ridiculous and having fun. And also like, I don't know, sometimes you can't check every box, but I, but I can see what he's saying. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and just a, a thought on that is, is realize people who are in Scientology and already know what the OT levels are, aren't going to be shocked and horrified by hearing someone mentioning Xenu and hmm. people who are not on the OT levels yet and have no idea what's on them have hmm. no idea that Xenu is what's actually on the OT levels. So they as well aren't going to be horribly offended. They're going to think we're lying. The first time, yeah, Jenna, Jenna I forget this happened to me sometimes still during the first golden age of tech evolution. Mm hmm. Uh, we were hanging out outside the one-stop shop as we would, you know, drinking our Cokes and eating our Snickers bar. One-stop shop. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> and some non-Scientologist came up and started handing out flyers to us with Xenu on the front. Um, and I remember being all like, oh, my God, oh, my yeah. God. Like it, And then I ran inside and I found a SEOG member. And I'm like, this person's passing this out and saying this is what's on the OT levels. I was like reporting the guy. Um, and, of course, the SEOG <laughs> member just pretended that he knew nothing about any of it. Um and I guess I'm telling this story because no part of me at all believed that what this guy was saying was on the OT levels was real. I thought he was saying this stuff just to give people false information. Right. I can relate to that as well. Cause I remember when I was in Florida at flag and um, like there was like a period where a lot of people were protesting against Scientology and like, they were like, don't look at their signs and every, once in a while I would look and it would say something about aliens or something. And I was like, bro, those guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know that it was like a real thing. <laughs> That's right. It's actually one of the reasons I continuously joke about it is because I want Scientologists who aren't on the OT levels yet to know this is what's really on it, guys. Right, like, yeah. hear us big bad SPs say it now. So that yeah. you can think we're lying. And then when you get there, you'll be like, you're telling me these SPs were right the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And I know when I like heard what the story was, I was like, I was kind of like, That's what I've been like waiting for. Like just sounded like crazy, but um also like just very like anticlimactic. Exactly. And there wasn't like anything big that happened after I found out. So, and had you ever heard anything about Xenu or body thetans until? Oh, have you had you ever heard anything about that while you were still in Scientology? No, I hadn't heard about it at all. And I was always like really curious. Like I was always looking for hints to what was in OT three because it was like this big mystery. And I remember at the end of Key to Life, like I thought the factors were gonna like give me some answers to these questions, and I was like what the fuck the first there who get what I was like I was so annoyed <laughs> and I would like spend a lot of time at the qual library with the librarian Alice yeah. she was like OT something and I was I was like so Alice I was like always trying to find out what books like allude to what's in there and she would always like get like say little things that were like knowing like well maybe there's similar things here or whatever but she would never say directly so I was like always trying to find out. <laughs> oh, I remember Alice. Alice Von Grundle. Yes. Or yeah. Grundle. Was she nice to you? Because I've never met a more a meaner person in my life. <laughs> Someone who I would always go to the library with would call her Alice the Barbarian instead of Alice the Librarian. <laughs> and she was so mean that it was funny. Oh, it was like, like watching like mean tweets. Like she was so mean that it was like, like I, she was kind of a boss for like, being willing to be like such an asshole and not giving a fuck. <laughs> she was vicious. <laughs> she was. I mean, she she would police how people were holding books when reading them. <laughs> God forbid you happen to be leaning on any portion of that book at any moment. It's like it's like she had radar. You know, <laughs> she'd kick you out of the library. Oh, totally. Yeah, she was. <laughs> I think that because like. I was really nice to her anyways. Like I just like took it in stride. Like we were like buddies. She later was at, um, went to middle management 
she came there. I don't know why she was there, but it was like, Alice, hey, like we were like besties. <laughs> wow. Middle management. That's crazy. Yeah. I guess being a librarian was probably some sort of a punishment from the get go. <laughs> I mean, oh, maybe that seems like a fun job. I know, but why would she be so angry all the time? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> she really was, though. <laughs> uh, and with a super sticker, thank you very much. Very kind. Uh, Barbara Mangano. But uh, bravery is doing something even though you're scared. Totally. I love that definition. Mitch Brisker's in the chat. Uh, thank you for the super sticker, Mitch. Uh, let me see here. Mm -mm -mm. Robin S., um, Jenna, how do you feel about Shelly right now and her disappearance, quote unquote, uh, from your book? It seems she was so nice and also, I'm sorry, so mean to you in the past. I forgot that you talked about Shelly in your book. It's been so long since I've read your book. I honestly don't remember what's in it to be. I just, Me um, neither. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <clears throat> um, how, how do you feel about the whole Shelly thing? I mean, I feel like. Like, it doesn't seem like she's in a good place, you know? So I feel sad for her. I do honestly feel sad for her. And she did do mean things to me and everybody. I think that she felt like she was doing them for the right reasons, though, more than anybody else. Like, I think she really believed. And I do think that she did really try to minimize Dave's actions. And, um, like, no matter how mean she was to me when I was there, she always came back and made it right, even if it was quite a while later. And I don't think that that makes it okay, but it makes her relatable to me and empathetic to her. I mean, when she was in Scientology and in the Sea Org when she was just a little kid. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> it is interesting to note that a lot of these um, people, I mean, hell, even Miscavige. Well, no, Miscavige. Mm -hmm. Like, but Miscavige wasn't born into Scientology. I, I can't remember. He wasn't Shelley. born into it, but he, like, he was, was young, in it right? as a kid. Yeah, yeah, as like a young teenager. Yeah, and Shelly, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to misspeak. I know she was in the Sea Org when she, on the ship when she was like, you know, eleven or twelve. Um, yeah. I just don't remember whether she was actually. Born, I mean, I know that's young enough age. Like, I, I was four when my mom got into it, but I'll say I was born into it. Do you happen right. to know if Shelly was literally born into it? I actually don't know. I know that she told me that she was already a messenger when she was nine. Like oh, she yeah. told she me had that. To be born into it. She had to be born. Yeah. Into it. Cause she told me that when I was nine and she was like, well, I was already a messenger when I was nine. And I was like, well, I guess I'm just a loser then. Cause I was still at the ranch. If she was already a messenger when she was nine, then she had to be on the ship. Like she couldn't have yeah, been a messenger without being on the ship at, at that age. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually don't know what, it, but she was on the ship, so. Right, 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 right. Maybe it was her sister who was 12 and, and Shelly was even younger. Janice knows all the dates. I forget all those things. Um, yeah. But let me ask you this, because I, 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 I started a, a new narrative about Shelly on my channel, at least a new narrative for my channel this week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it has to do with the fact that um, I'm more open to the possibility that... Shelly and Dave are actually divorced and he might have remarried um, Lou, Larise. Mm. Um, and, and, and the reason, did you see, did you see what I said about that this week already? I saw the title of it. So you didn't watch, watch the video. That's okay. Just admit it. You didn't watch Sorry. the video. <laughs> <laughs> so up until now, I, I've been of, I've basically agreed with what Mike Rinder has said in response to this question, because I have always been under the impression it is simply not possible for David Miscavige to be having extramarital relations with another Seerg member and for anybody to put up with that. Like for me, that's been outside of the realm of something I considered possible. Mm -hmm. And people would ask Mike the question of like, so do you think Dave is messing around behind Shelly's back with, you know, his assistant, Larice or mm -hmm. Lou? And Mike has always said, no, even when Dave and Shelly together, they weren't like romantic, you know, sexual people. I think Valerie Haney has said, she, to her knowledge, they would sleep together maybe once or twice a year. They had separate bedrooms. And, and Mike was like, yeah, they had separate apartments. Even. They had separate apartments. Yeah. All right. And so Mike was like, there's no reason for Dave to be messing around with anybody. He's sort of this like asexual person. And that made sense to me. I mean, hell, I didn't know Dave. I'll take Mike's word for it. And it rings true. 
<laughs> now, um, the more anecdotes and stories and opinions have been coming out mm -hmm. that Dave is seems to be sleeping with Larice. The more I go, well, what makes more sense? That that David Miscavige is openly in a relationship with someone who's not his wife and Sea Org members are tolerating this or that he just somehow got secretly divorced and remarried and there's no paperwork and no one's been able to prove it. Like which one of those makes more sense? So I'm not saying one, one way is the way that it is and one way isn't. I'm just saying one of those scenarios makes more sense to me than another one of those scenarios. And then I got a message from someone who worked for Tom Cruise that was like, after such and such a date, we no longer were sending any birthday presents or Christmas presents to Shelly at all, but we were still sending them to Dave. And I was like, sounds to me like they may not be married anymore. Um, do you mm -hmm. have any opinion on this whatsoever? Do you think anybody would put up with David Miscavige openly being in a relationship with someone while still being married to Shelly? I do think that they would put up with anything that he did. Honestly, even if it was like, it can like, just like people were putting up with him hitting people. Like it can be like, Oh, that was for the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. Right. So whatever he's doing is right. But I don't see him being like openly in a relationship, like in that way. Like maybe people were like seeing stuff happening, but he, I, I can't imagine him being like me and Lou are in love and we're now together or something like that. Like that, right. that seems like an impossibility to me, but I mean, I can see. I mean, I don't know if he's divorced from Shelly, but I could see why there would be good legal reasons for him to, to his benefit, you know? That him too would what? To divorce her. Mm. Because as a spouse, you have certain legal rights. Mm, interesting. Let me ask what? you this. Let me ask mm -hmm. you this. People were putting up with Dave beating people, right? I mean, to, mm -hmm. people were basically putting up with that. E e even though there were people who were like, hey, this isn't okay. Like, chill out. Don't do that. The truth is it was tolerated. Absolutely. But there was also a trickle-down effect. Miscavige setting uh, an example of violence had a trickle-down effect over, you know, a 10, 15, 20-year period where violence became more prevalent at other Sea Org bases because people knew it was okay with Dave and it wasn't something you were going to get in a lot of trouble for. Mm. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, that he sort of set that that standard or would do you think I'm overstating it? Um, I wasn't in as long as you were. Mm. So like I. What are you talking about? I was only this year for four years. <laughs> oh, I know. But you were you said that you didn't you leave in like 2014 or something? Uh, true. Yeah. But I uh, left. I got declared in 2014. OK, because I left in 2005. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. So like at that time, it was just like, come. it was the first I'd heard of Dave beating people from my mom who saw it firsthand and then also Mark Headley. And so I feel like it had not had enough time to um, like where I wasn't like seeing people randomly beating people, but they were like, um, like keeping people in auditing rooms or like making them scrub dumpsters with a tooth toothbrush and things like that. But it wasn't like rampant that I saw every day. And I was also away for a year before I left in Australia. Right, 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 right. But I can um, imagine there would be. <clears throat> I mean. Here's where I was going with that. Um, I, even though I think people would put up with pretty much anything as long as Miscavige, you know, made them. Mm -hmm. I don't see how Miscavige would be able to penalize anyone for going out 2D if everyone knew that he was sleeping with someone that wasn't his wife. I just no, don't I see totally how those get... two things go together. They don't, but that's like the mind fuck of it all. Like it was literally like, Dave can call the int base, but you can't. And then it's like, but all the other kids were like, they just did that all the time. Like that was the case literally all the time for me that it was like, you can't do this thing, but all the other executives were. So it like, I guess it just amounted to they're so important 
and I'm not, and I haven't earned this right. And they're doing it for some reason. Like I would just make up reasons in my head. I mean, I remember after I left, I spoke to a friend of mine and I said, I told him I was like, but Dave like beats people. And he was like, well, I don't believe that that's true. And I said, okay, but if you knew it was true, if you knew for sure that he did that, you saw it with your own eyes, then what would you say? And he said, then I would assume that it was for the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. Right. So it didn't even matter if he did that or not, you know, right, right, as right. far as he was concerned, it would just be categorized as they must be doing it for a good reason because it's him. Right, right, right. So I spoke recently with someone who worked closely with Dave and left only a couple of years ago, meaning she was working closely with Dave up until a couple of years ago. Okay. And I asked her about this just yesterday. And I said, did you, were you under the impression that Dave and Larice, I call her Larice, everyone else calls her Lou, but I can't call a woman Lou. Were you under the impression that Dave and Larice were a couple? And she mm -hmm. goes, I was absolutely under that impression. This is someone who worked, mm -hmm. at, she was a Sea member, worked yeah, yeah. closely with Dave. She goes, not only was I under that impression, public opinion leaders, big shots who would come and meet with Dave. Mm -hmm would come to me and say, oh, I met with Dave and I met with COB and his wife. Like people mm. were people who interacted with them who weren't COB mm. members would okay. also come away with the impression that they were a couple. And I'm just going mm. to myself. Sure. Are there separate rules for Miscavige? Yes. Would people probably explain away anything he wanted to do? Yes. Mm. I still go. Why the fuck would he stay married to Shelly? At this point, it wouldn't even make sense. Like, does he really want all the Sea Org people around him to think cheating on his wife or could he just have divorced Shelly and remarried Loris? and why would he be doing something behind Shelly's back and the the more obvious explanation to me is they probably got divorced 15 y years ago why is that a why is that a controversial thing to say I don't think um, it's a controversial thing to say it's definitely possible yeah. you know it's definitely right. and I'm sure that if he wanted a divorce then she would just be like, sure, of course. Yes, sir. Whatever you want. Whatever is good for Scientology. So I don't think it's just, it's controversial at all. I think it's just like a conjecture based on what I know. But I think that I don't have up-to-date knowledge like you do. And I'm not speaking to people who are just there. Yeah. So, and also I'm always surprised by what winds up being the truth. Yeah. No, but what's interesting, and, and this, and that's why it's so, um, uh, in my opinion, awesome and cool and fun to get different perspectives on this, mm -hmm. is even the person who told me this a couple of days ago mm -hmm. still thought that Dave could totally get away with sleeping with someone other than Shelly, and people would find a way to explain it away. It wouldn't be as big of a deal as I think it would be. Because I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding? People's lives have been destroyed for just mm -hmm. touching a boob before they got married. That's true. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> culturally speaking, sleeping with someone before marriage or outside of marriage is l quite literally, for some reason, the worst thing you could possibly do in the Sea Org. It's like the worst thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and totally. so why in the world would Miscavige want to be surrounded by people who were under the impression he was sleeping with someone other than his wife? It just seems that it would undermine his own power, his own position. Could he get away with it? Sure, he could probably get away with anything. But why undermine his own reputation like that with people he's working with? That's why I go, it just doesn't make sense to me. I see what you mean. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Because you know saying. how closely they police what people are thinking. Oh, my God. Did you have any thoughts about Dave? Do you have any critical thoughts about Dave? Do you have any? And apparently they sec check people just as much about critical thoughts about Larice, who, um, by the way, by the way, when you were in the Sea Org, did you, was she called CCR? Because I'm told her post title, COB's communicator is for some reason um, uh, shortened to CCR. Oh, no, it was just COB's calm. COB's calm. Uh, it's, yeah. Apparently it's become um, not okay to actually say COB. You have to call him Department Twenty One or or com or Command. They call him Command. Okay. They call him Command Department D Twenty One Command or the Boss is how they refer to him. Oh, Apparently, wow. it's out security to say COB because now people know who you're talking about. 
All righty then. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> It's just so fucking weird. <laughs> I know. Crazy ass shit. <laughs> um, all right. Lethanda Grauklinger from the SP country of Germany. Uh, thanks for doing a live at a European friendly time. Was it scary to think of the reactions before you released your book? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, mostly like from my family. <laughs> um. Like your Miscavige family or your um, husband's family at the time? Um, my Miscavige family, because oh, I'm yeah. writing about my upbringing in there, you know, and then also from Scientology, I was like, yeah, I was scared, but just did it anyways. And it wound up okay. It wasn't too bad. There wasn't too many terrible things that happened as a result of it. Is there, is there anything that stands out as like um, a particularly memorable way Scientologists tried to, tried to mess with you or anything like that after the book came out? Well, they did it before the book came out a lot. So they had been doing it for years. So by the time the book came out, I had already been on like TV several times. And so, and I think that they were like, they had lost Dallas's family as a way to get to me directly. But they were like, I mean, we were being followed by PIs. Um, like there was a guy who lived with us for a little bit, who I'm pretty sure was a plant for Scientology. And um, they're like, he, like Dallas's parents would meet with Scientology executives. Like they met with Jenny Linson and Angie Blankenship. And they would talk with Kirsten Catano continually. Tommy Davis and his wife met with them. Um, so Even though they, they were, were just, already declared or were they not declared yet? No, it was before they were declared. Oh, wow. So and you they were, were doing just, all this and Dallas's folks were still technically in good standing. Yeah. Not when my book came out. By the time my book came out, they weren't really. Or actually after my book came out, they were no longer in good standing. But um, But before that, they were. And so they were putting a lot of pressure on them to put a lot of pressure on Dallas to put a lot of pressure on me. Mm. Who was the plant? It was this guy named Mateo. He had been Dallas's friend in, in the Sea Org. Not Mateo Galbiati. No, <laughs> I forget his last name though. Was, was he like a middle management guy? Yeah, but he was like, but it wasn't Mateo Galbiati, but okay. yeah, he was in middle management. He worked with Dallas in, Senior HCO. Mm. Oh, okay. A lot of people know who you're talking about. I, I most for the most part didn't know any of those guys, but I've heard yeah. I've heard a lot about Mateo and Senior HCO for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Rusty says about Shelley, an understanding of Bolivar policy is important. Uh, that's a pretty inside um, reference in Scientology, and I don't think we need to explain that. But yes, I, I agree with you. Do you agree, do you agree with that? That that helps to understand Shelley, the third dynamic power formula. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, next one here. Champagne Hand. Your book was one of my first dives into Scientology. My dad blew my family apart with Landmark, so aspects were relatable and appreciated. Thank you. Oh, good. Very cool. Sarah S. says, Jenna, thank you for your courage and vulnerability. Have you found things in your post-Scientology life that bring you joy, kids, vocation, hobbies, causes? <laughs> definitely not my kids no I'm just joking <laughs> <laughs> of course my kids um but um yeah I have like so many hobbies that it's actually out of control it's a problem I don't know how to stop too many <laughs> yeah definitely I love doing all sorts of things like making pottery growing up flowers baking cooking too many things programming it's it's out of control so how did, you get on. In, how did you get into programming? Um, a friend of mine was doing it and um, I don't know, we just talked about it and it seemed like really interesting. Like it sounded like something that was like creative, but it wasn't thought of in that way where you can build something for, from scratch. And so I thought it sounded really interesting and, and it was when I nice. was learning about it. Yeah. So what kind of programming do you do? How would you describe it to the uninitiated or the mildly initiated? 
Um, it's like web development. So like building websites and stuff like that. And you do this professionally? Um, no, not yet. I'm just learning about it. I actually have like a little bit of work in that, but yeah. Cool. I'm working Very on cool. it. Very cool. Loves the ocean says, Jenna, your book was wonderful. You seem to have had such a good sense of yourself and your own values at a young age in that situation. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, um, I guess I did have a sense of myself and my values when it came down to it, but I don't think that I really knew what they were when things were happening. I, but I think that when push came to shove, there were certain things that I would accept and not accept, but I, I didn't have it like delineated what they were. I wish I had had that more. It would have helped me. Awesome. Um, I'm looking for, okay, this is about the Xenu conversation. Um, I thought no one ever discussed the OT secrets, even with their spouses. Wouldn't that make the name be shocking? Uh, oh, okay. This is referring to the fact that I said someone who'd already done the OT levels wouldn't be horribly offended. <clears throat> I do know what you mean, Michelle. Um, offended in the sense, uh, what I actually mean when I say that, I would mean they would know that what we were saying was true. Um, when I talk about being offended or having a negative reaction to what I saw on ESMB, it's because it seemed untrue. It seemed exaggerated. It seemed intentionally made to sound worse. It, it didn't strike me as just laying it out the way it really was. That's why I found it offensive. Whereas, yes, yeah, someone could be like, oh, shit, they're talking about the confidential stuff. They're just a bunch of SPs. Somebody might think that. Mm -hmm. They're at least not going to think we're lying about it. That's actually what I meant. But Right. Yeah. But it is true that it was never discussed with anybody or their spouses or Anybody, we're not allowed to discuss it among people. Right. Um, let me see. I'm looking for questions that just aren't like super, super, super general um, Scientology questions. Oh, here's one. Um, Robin S. Question. Do you still have habits that are hard to break from growing up on the ranch? Um, yeah, I do have some like just stupid things like. I like ask to go to the bathroom and people are like, okay, sure. I don't care. <laughs> Who are you and asking? I don't know. Just whoever I'm with all the time. <laughs> like, Can I go? To They're like, <laughs> They're like, I don't care. Sure. Why are you asking? <laughs> but I still do it. I don't know why. Um, and then I do like tend to like work all weekend on like projects endlessly for my house in the garden, just like, I feel like weird if I'm not working on something like I'm like being a slacker or something. So it's yeah. like kind of nonstop. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Amy Jones, how has the experience of Scientology influenced how you live your life on the outside? Uh, as in, are you hypervigilant with new friendships? Do you value family differently? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that I'm hyper vigilant with new friendships because I'm like very trusting and I trust everybody until I have a reason not to. And I, I think because I found that like people on the outside have like immediately been validating an understanding of my experiences and they've been like, Whoa, what happened? That sounds crazy. And so I've for the most part, only met like just really nice, kind people. Um, but um, I guess I do value family differently. I mean, I value my own family and my kids, but I will say that I often like butt up. This is not going to sound good at all. But when people say family is everything and um, and of course that's true, but it has not been my experience in my life. In my experience, my friends have been everything. I lived with my people who are my friends and they're people who I choose to be in my life, who I'm not 
forced to be with, even if they're abusive towards me. So I like love my kids more than anything in the whole world, but different people have different experiences with family. Not all families are the same. And I think both experiences are valid. And um, yeah, and I think that you have to act accordingly. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Let's see, Stephen Britton. When you stomped on the cans, did they get disconnected from the meter as well? It surprises me they did not immediately RPF you for that. Um, they like there's like a little plug that you unplug. So, but it's like really quick. You can just unplug them, and then so yeah, they were disconnected from the e meter. But I mean, it was so soon. Um, like I left so shortly after that they were just like trying to get me under control. So if I had stayed, I'm sure I would have been sent to the RPF or to Australia to be in a States cleaner or something, <laughs> but there just wasn't time for that. It's funny when they sent you to Australia, I guess I'm surprised that they even brought you guys back or were you not really in trouble at that time? You know, they didn't even really want to bring us back. I, I <laughs> We weren't in trouble, but we were like, why are we here? This mission is over. Like, we need to come back now, but they didn't even like, we had to like fight to come back. So. Wow. But, and, and that's funny though, right? Cause you said it was actually a great, um, relatively great experience being there. What were you guys fighting to go back for? That's a good point. Um, it was just like, well, there's so many rules in Scientology. Like we were supposed to be on a mission. And if you don't complete it in a certain way, like you're in trouble. And it was like, we had like mission orders and they just didn't apply for the mission we were on. So I think it was actually out of fear of getting in bigger trouble if we didn't insist on coming back and getting a mission that made sense, you know? So I, but it is like just very interesting because it's just another example of how people police themselves in the end. Like they don't even need to police people all the time. It's just, you train them to police themselves and, and that's what happens. That's a really good answer. Yeah. Cause as a Sea Org member, yeah, you'd be more in trouble of being found guilty of having a failed mission than, Oh, can we please stay here for as long as possible? Right. Yeah, exactly. Did they, did, did anyone ever try to RPF you during your Sea Org career? I got told a lot that I should have been going on the RPF, but I was just going on the EPF or I was just going on the CMO EPF, but nobody sent me to the RPF. No, I think that they think that it would have looked bad on them. Right. Like how did you, did you get sent to the cat B EPF? No, but I did do the EPF like much later because when I went to flag, when I was 12, I hadn't done the EPF and I was like made a Sea Org member immediately. And I like kind of always felt like a fraud. Like I wasn't really a Sea Org member because I hadn't done the EPF. And so I like had, I wrote this letter to Shelly and I was like, I want to do the EPF because I feel like fraudulent. And then she like, then this whole thing came down like where she was like, you need to do the EPF because it's fraudulent and everyone does it. And I was like, that's what I said. But I like somehow, <laughs> like she had the idea that I was saying that I didn't want to. And so then I got like a security check and then I did the EPF and it was just so confusing. <laughs> I was like, I literally wrote you to say I wanted to do it. And I'm like in trouble for saying I didn't want to, but whatever. Who was your EPF? I see. Check. Who was your EPF? I see. Dave Inglehart. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh wait, this was at Flag or yeah, oh, Flag. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. He was crazy. I remember Dave and Lori Inglehart. Yes. Uh, I wonder if she's still there. Could she still be alive? I mean, is she not still the same post? I she just have no be. idea. I just. I've, oh yeah, I've, she could definitely still be alive. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> In fact, but she he was wouldn't crazy. Be. Was he crazy? Yeah, he was so crazy. He would just like scream at the top of his lungs all the time. He would like, like we would be like at a muster or like a meeting and he'd be like, what's that smell? And he'd be like, 
somebody's feet smell. And he'd be like walking around like, and then he'd be like, you. And then he'd like grab the person's foot and like, like just like turn them upside down. It was like so fucking weird. He's like, it's like, <laughs> oh, it's definitely you. Yeah. And then he would just like go psychotic on them. And then at the end of the EPF, we had to like sail. I did the EPF really fast because I was like, I got to get out of here. Like I just did it the fastest I've ever done anything. And he um, at the end, though, we had to like go sailing because it was like part of the EPF to like have a Sea Org experience on a sailboat. And it was like me and one other girl and it was with him. And it was just like he was like, get the like he would use all this like boat terminology. He'd be like, get the blah. And, he'd, and we'd be like, huh? And he'd be like, no. And then like this thing would like come swinging around to like hit us. And we were like on the ocean. It was just like, I don't know what was happening. Were you, did they have that little boat, the Diana? No, it was some other little boat, though. Uh, yeah. I remember thinking they had, like, we're going to restore the Diana and use it to, like, train Sea Org members on some shit or something like that. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I don't think it was the Diana. Okay. Um, the only thing, one of the things I remember about, um, what was his name again? Dave Inglehart. Right. Is that, do you remember in the flag internship course room, there was a giant photo on the wall and it was L. Ron Hubbard standing behind a desk with his hand out. And it was someone with folders handing L. Ron Hubbard PC folders. And I just remember oh. everyone knew that's Dave Englehart in that photo, handing L. Ron oh. Hubbard those PC folders. And it was like, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> when he was a kid. Um, he wasn't even a kid in the photo, to be honest. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah, he was older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Michelle Carpenter has a question. Uh, we have a mutual friend out in San Diego. She told me she had no idea you were ever in Scientology until after she read your book. How intentional mm -hmm. was the secrecy? What was that like? Hmm. I'm, I'm assuming this is a non-Scientologist mutual friend. Um, oh. So like when you were out and you're mm -hmm. in San Diego, would you intentionally, yeah, how would that, you, like, so you meet new people. Mm -hmm. Do you intentionally not tell people your history or your name or, or what your name means or right, whatever? Right. Would you, would you hold that back from people? I don't intentionally not tell people, but I like, it's not like exactly the first thing I bring up. <laughs> Because they're like usually like around their children and they don't want some like ex cult psychotic person. It's not this, it's not the opening line, but I also don't hide it at all. Like mm. I tell people if they ask about it and everyone's really cool about it. That's so cool. it's not a secret at all. I'm not hiding it. I think it's gotta, some be, people, it's gotta be a great conversation starter. Yeah. People are usually like, wait, what? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that early on, like even when like my parents were out of Scientology, like it was like a little bit of a secret for them at their work. And and maybe it was at first at my first job that I had. But I, I feel like it's like a little bit of a trap. Like you feel like you're having to hide yourself all the time and you're like afraid that people don't know. And I've definitely found that it's like a lot more freeing just to tell people people are really super cool about it. And I think that it was um, just made life a lot easier when they did. Yeah, that's cool. Linda Bedwell with a super sticker. Very kind of you. Uh, Michelle Carpenter, uh, J1. Oh, Jenna. One, you and I are cut from the same cloth. I have too many hobbies. Starts a YouTube channel. Two, will you be going on Claire's Shelley series? Three, what programming languages are you working with? <laughs> um, maybe. Maybe I'll go on Claire's series. Um, but I'm working with um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and React. Nice. <laughs> That's hot. <laughs> 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 Jen with a super sticker, very kind. Um, Free Zena Project. Jenna, you said you had to almost fight to come back. Do you think you were sent there to be put out of sight, out of mind? I definitely think that. Yeah, I'm sure of it. If they, it, when you were fighting to come back, were they, and this is from um, the mission you were on in Canberra, Australia, right? Mm -hmm. Were they like, no, you have to stay there because the mission isn't done? Or were they kind of like, don't worry about it. Do you guys want to just stay there? Like what, what were they saying? 
Yeah, they were kind of like the second one. Like, actually, when we were there, my grandma had passed away. So I actually wanted to come back to like, go to her funeral. And I was like asking to come back and just like nobody gave a shit. And then after that, um, they were just like not answering like, yeah, we know we need to get back to you, but we're really bu busy with this evolution. And um, but we'll get back to you when it's time. And that just went on for months where even people in like, like in Anza were like, because we because at the beginning, by the beginning of 2005, we had gone to Sydney and they were like, why are you here? And we were like, we don't know either. It was just like, so I think that by the time it, like the questions, whoops, came from like multiple people, they were like, okay, now we just look weird for keeping them there. So now we have to bring them back. They wouldn't let you go back for your grandmother's funeral? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads us right into the next question. Uh, Linda Bedwell says, were you and your children able to spend time with your grandmother after you left Scientology? Every time you speak of her, I can tell what a special connection you had with her. Hmm. Yeah, no, unfortunately, she was already gone by the time I had my kids. Wow. But I wish she would have loved them a lot and they would have really loved her. Wow. That is just so uniquely horrible. Not surprising, but I didn't... I, you know, you've mentioned so many times already how, how close, how much you liked her. Yeah. Did they specifically say disapproved or did they just not respond to the requests? They didn't say disapproved, but they just like, were like, sorry, we've been so busy. Just the same thing. Like they didn't even like respond to it specifically. And then I remember when I finally got back, which was just shortly after her funeral and she passed away they like tried to give me this like auditing session about it like they would do those net assists i don't know it's like a dynetics whatever thing and i like, got, like loss of a person assist or or that's different no it's like a that's something else oh. it was like dynetics and i got like really 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 sick um and i like like had to go to the hospital and I like passed out in the hospital and I was like this was in Australia they, no this was when I was back in LA so oh. they brought us back like just after the funeral so so, so annoying like oh my god yeah so I could have gone back but yeah but her funeral was wasn't was at Florida in Florida anyways like they let my parents go who weren't in Scientology or the Sea Org anymore. Wow. They let them go to that funeral? Were, were, but mm -hmm. they hadn't, they hadn't, they hadn't officially been declared, right? That's true, but I don't know if they have ever been officially declared. But I think they were like trying to keep the peace with them. Right. Wow. They let them go to that, but not you. Did you, were you in touch? Were you in touch with your parents during that time that you were in Australia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh. they were going and like. So they told you they were going to the funeral. You knew they would be, they, they would be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I would have been so upset. I'm just, I don't know why it's so surprising to me. I mean, the same thing. They, they were not even going to let me go to my brother's funeral. So I don't know why it's surprising, but um, that's what I mean when I, I said, when I say sometimes if they just treated people like, 10 percent better exactly they'd probably never lose anybody exactly it's so true yeah it's um carol duk asks jenna are you worried about fair game this time around due to you being away from it for so long um a little bit yeah but doing it anyways <laughs> Uh, I almost hope they try some shit because then you'll have some. Oh, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> I mean, don't you? Aren't you like, go ahead, try some shit. Try some shit, motherfucker. See what happens. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Street justice. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. No, not really. <laughs> I guess now I am. I mean, you wrote a book. Like I never that. wrote a book, you know? I'd be like... <laughs> Oh boy. All right. Let's see. Um, oh, Mitch is asking, uh, did you do the Purif as a child? 
Uh, yeah, I did it when I was nine. Tell, I know okay. we discussed it last time, but tell, how did you come to do the Purif? Like I was told when I was 13 that because my personality test was above the center line and because I had no history of drug use, I did not have to do the Purif. Why did you end up having to do the Purif at nine years old? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that my personality test was above the center line, though. <laughs> That's how they get I you. Once, I once took it. <laughs> and like, you know how they give you those evaluations after? Yeah. I once took it and it was like, you are cold blooded and heartless. Like it was like. <laughs> It was like the worst evaluation that anyone had ever gotten. <laughs> it said I was like a sociopath. And I was like, whoa. So maybe that's why. I didn't know what the questions, I didn't even understand them. <laughs> so, because I was just nine, I didn't know what questions they were asking. And I was probably overly honest. <laughs> it just said that. So maybe that's why I got to do it and not you. Well, well, I, I do remember though, the first time I took the personality tests and I'm all like just being honest to all the questions. And I remember my mom afterwards, cause I didn't know like good, bad, who gives a shit. I was just like, just answer the yeah, questions. It's not like a pass same. or fail thing. I remember my mom being horrified at the results. <laughs> I just I, <laughs> like, it looks like my child is, is uh, the most depressed person who's ever existed on earth. And yes. I'm like, I'm like, I, and I remember she almost, I'm sure she would dispute these facts, but <laughs> almost had a private conversation where she almost con confronted would be the wrong word. Cause it's not like, how dare you answer the questions poorly, but like <laughs> deeply concerned. <laughs> and I remember almost thinking like that was my first lesson. Oh, okay. Now I've learned the lesson. Don't be honest on the fucking test, I guess. <laughs> Cause you're going to get shit for the answers. And <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> But then eventually I realized, oh, there's right answers. And there's, they tell you there's no wrong answer. It's like bullshit. There's no wrong oh, answer. Totally. Yes. Especially when you have to have your test be in a certain way in order to do certain things, like to, in order to be part of a certain group or do a certain thing, like you learn pretty quickly, like what are the good answers and what are the bad ones? Exactly. Hey, did you ever go through the testing the testing pack or the the answer pack for the IQ test and memorize all the right answers? No, I didn't do that. I just I got them all, all right the on my time. own. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I did that all the time. So <laughs> not only do you have to get the answers right, but the faster you do the test, the higher your score. I would literally oh. practice going through each version of the test. Like, oh. <laughs> oh, that makes me feel better. I didn't do that. I never, I didn't, like, I was a kid. I didn't understand half the questions, like the bird in the bush. What I, I don't, I was so confused by that. <laughs> Not only the IQ test, but the aptitude as well. And the oh, leadership. Yeah. I mean, I would just go through oh. the testing, the testing manual and just memorize all the right answers. Oh, that's awesome. The aptitude test was easy. That was like, I always got good on that one. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and isn't it funny? I think the highest test you can get on the highest score you can get on Scientology's IQ test is 155. And oh. eventually just everybody would have a 155 because <laughs> they just always give you the same test over. And yes, over. it's the be, same one. And, th and there might be three different versions, but it's like you're still doing the same one over. You take those tests so many totally. freaking times. Exactly. Know? Yeah. By the, you, by, if <clears throat> you haven't learned from all that testing, then you yeah. deserve the score you get. <laughs> Isn't it funny to consider that it's also in Scientology's best interests for you to learn the right answers because Scientology likes to say that the more of Scientology you do, the higher your IQ and aptitude go. So they don't really care if your score is artificially high because they can they still get to take credit for the increase. That's true. But actually, if it's low, they win either way because then they can get you to do auditing. Yeah. I mean, if you're a public, like for us, yeah, our scores true. just determined <laughs> what posts we were allowed to be on. So it was in our best interests to that's have true. high scores public. I mean, you're right. um, I bet public don't take those tests nearly as often as staff members and CR members do. That's a good point. You're right. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. So, so you did the Purifit nine. Yeah. Probably because of those OCA scores. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was there... Uh, where did you do it? Was it flag? No, it was at the int base. It was like this little cottage building. Um, and it was like me and like 
just like some dudes in there that were like way older. Huh. Did do you remember? Did you have to go the full the full high high dose niacin? The, anyway, the, even the rules on that has changed uh, with the golden age attack too, and all that kind of weird stuff. Do you oh, remember? Okay. Oh, you, you said you like, would hide your vitamins and stuff, right? Yeah, but you can't you can't hide from the niacin. You have to take that. It, you have to take it when you're there. So I think it went up to like 3000. But I remember I started at like a half dose because I like I like had a reaction like right away or something because I was just a kid. So they like halved it, but I went all the way up to the 3000, I think. And then you had to drink oil, which was terrible. That was like the worst. And then you had to take lecithin. And then there was like all these vitamins. And then you had to drink the CalMag which was disgusting. And then you had to run for 30 minutes and then you had to be in the sauna for five hours. Yeah. It, even today, I still see actually more so now than ever. I see kids being put through the Purif and I just really question what the rationale is. Um, actually, I guess at this point it would be all the toxins in the environment and the food and the, water and that would probably be the justification for it now but it used to be if you didn't have a drug history mm -hmm. but now they consider just existing gives you a drug history kind of yeah i mean i think that you have to do it no matter what though everyone does and i think like when i was a little kid when i like first moved to la i had asthma i got asthma and so i think i had to have like be given like some sort of drugs for that and maybe that's what they counted that makes sense that makes sense yeah. do you have asthma now no i had it um just like when we first moved to la and i was a baby and then my parents would say that they would have to like rush me to the hospital in the middle of the night because my breathing would get out of control and then they told me that the way that it stopped was that they basically like one night when it was really bad, they basically were like, Jenna, that's it. We can't do this anymore. You need to stop. And then I never had it again. But they I was tone, like, they tone 40 your asthma exactly. away. Exactly. <laughs> and they, anyways, um, but, um, <laughs> and I was like, well, was I lying then? Did I not have it? Was I, trying to get attention and they said well no you went to the hospital and they said you had it so they like x-rayed your lungs or whatever your wherever the fuck asthma is but yeah so i don't know i don't know how that worked wow well so i was gonna ask you that have they always credited scientology with getting rid of your asthma just like they credit scientology with a so-called getting rid of dave miscavige's asthma but it seems like they don't even give scientology credit they're taking the credit <laughs> They did it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dave had it when he was a lot older and I think it was a lot more like a big part of his life that was holding him back. Like couldn't do sports and whatever. So I, I only had it for a little bit because of that LA air and then it went away. Wow. Yeah. I, I've actually, I've actually heard that from a number of people. The first time they get that disgusting LA air, they have some sort of breathing, um, breathing problem. Yeah. I think so, but, the LA air is a lot better now, though, because of like yeah. smog checks and whatever. There was like that could be. So, but you as a child were never like. Did you ever have it walk around with an inhaler or anything for asthma? I don't remember it at all. That's just huh. what I've been told by my parents. Interesting. So, wow. Yeah. Um, okay, Deborah Block says thank you for speaking up and helping the cause. Nice. Thank you. Um, Clearwater Chad says, see everyone tonight on Clearwater Chad's pre-show and the ultra legendary Mick, Mitch Brisker will be on the after gathering tonight. Oh, by pre-show, they're talking about the, the normal Monday night live guys. I haven't even lined up a Monday night live. I, because I've been going so hard, I keep honestly forgetting it's when Monday comes around. <laughs> it's a holiday. And actually today at seven o'clock, it is true. Today's a holiday. You'd never know it from watching my channel. Um, <laughs> Mike and Christy are going to be going live at 7 p.m. Eastern for an update on um, on Mike's health. So 
Um, I think Reese and I, Reese and I are planning on doing a video later this afternoon, and we will definitely be ending uh, at or before seven o'clock. So, Chad, if that affects your pre-show, post-show schedule or anything, um, just figured I'd let you know. Uh, let me see. Veronica Bombria question. How can we see these tests? I'd love to take them for shits and giggles. <laughs> I'm I sure actually, they're online. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually don't even know where to direct somebody to. I mean, um, they've got to be think, online. I totally think they are, because even after I left Scientology, when I worked at the business where Dallas's parents business, the jewelry store, like I was supposed to administer these tests to new recruits. So they like have them in the <laughs> secular world of wise or whatever. So they're definitely out there. I'm sure if you Google Scientology OCA test or personality test. Yes. And so guys, if you really want to, you know, go down this rabbit hole, you can look up the personality, te the personality tests, otherwise known as the OCA, the Oxford capacity analysis test, the Scientology aptitude test. I'm not sure. I've seen that floating around, but I can't say I've done a deep dive. There's actually four tests, the personality test, the OCA, the IQ, the aptitude, and the leadership, mm -hmm. the leadership test. The leadership test out of the four of those tests is the ones that when I looked at the answer sheet, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Some of the answers that are the right answers you would never suspect were the right answers. Um mm -hmm. I don't think I ever figured out what the right answers were on that. Let me give one. you let me give you an example. Okay. If a pre-clear gets better in an auditing session, what is the source? Um, what what is the actual source of the improvement? Is it the auditor's questions and commands? Mm -hmm. Is it the auditor himself? Uh, oh no, one is the answer. The pre-clear, uh, the auditor's questions and commands, the auditor, or L. Ron Hubbard. And I don't know, what do you think would be the logical answer there? What's the source of, of that pre-clear's improvement? The auditor and his commands? or L. Ron? That, to, that to me is the obvious one, right? Yeah. The right answer is L. Ron fucking Hubbard. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one answer that I would say is least likely to be the right answer. But now that I knew it was the right answer, you better believe that's the one I gave, right? <laughs> I don't think I ever answered it right then, but I, then that's essentially like a, how brainwashed are you that's test right. or how loyal are you? And isn't that interesting though, that that's who mm -hmm. they want as in leadership positions is someone who thinks that no matter what any improvement anyone experiences everywhere, that's because of L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Now it you says know. Dave, maybe. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. Mur. P. Um, did you feel like Jerry Maguire, who's with me when you tried to get coworkers to join into your in your revolt? I, I think they're talking about the cell phone revolt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did feel like that because only the one girl went with him, right? That's right. Yeah. And the and the goldfish. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I was, they screwed me over. Everyone did. They're liars. Tell I'm guessing most of the people watching right now don't know what story we're talking about. What What's the Jenna Miscavige oh. cell phone revolt of 2002? No, I don't know what year it was. <laughs> I think it was 2005 at the beginning, but they were basically like, I guess because it was 2005, some people um, had cell phones. That had never been the case before, but I don't know. They would just use them to call their families or whatever. Some people had it for their job, but even before you got it, you had to write a CSW, which is basically a proposal and get approval to have it, which I had done. Everyone had done who had it. And basically they just decided that they were going to take them away several months later and that it was like an external influence. And they just started slowly taking them away by slowly like being like, we shouldn't have given you approval. We shouldn't have given in. It was like, very gradual. And then it became like this, they issued a policy that was like, nobody can have cell phones anymore. And I was just like waiting for it to come to me. And so were like a, a few last like hangers on. And they were like, we don't want to give up our cell phone. And I was like, we won't like, let's just stick together. And we won't. It was like a bunch of people in the office that I was working in. Um, 
and they like didn't even like they were like can you give it to me and they were like okay and they just gave it to them and I was just like no I'm not giving you my cell phone they went to Dallas tried to convince him to give it to me I took it from Dallas because he would have given it to them and I was like you can't have this anymore it's mine it's my cell phone and then um yeah they just like harassed me about it every single day sent different like authority figures and like tried to give me like that rollback which is basically like where did you get the idea to do this thing like where that how they find it's like a it's like an auditing session um where they try to find out where you got like externally influenced in order to do something wrong and then it just like came to a head when I wouldn't give it up and like I said, I said, I started saying I was going to call the cops if they took it away because it was my personal property. And that like got me in more trouble. They were like, what did you just say? You just said that you were going to call the cops. And that was worse than the cell phone thing. But <laughs> I don't know how they didn't RPF you. Uh, I just, you know- I think they just know that I wouldn't have gone. Like, they'll be like, you're, you're going to the RPF. I've been like, okay, I'm going to my parents' house. Now that you mentioned the date, the same thing was happening over on the pack base because, and I know because I was one of the Sea Org members who had a cell phone and Not, gave it to them. I knew it. No, I'm just no, no, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, I had two cell phones. I had one for post, which was really a Nextel walkie talkie. It didn't have cell phone capability, but then I had a personal cell phone and everybody knew I would walk around with both the phones on my belt. It wasn't a secret. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was like, uh, but you have to understand, like before I joined the Sea Org, I still had all this life experience in the real world. And I'm thinking right. to myself, you want my phone? Like what a pointless gesture. So I'm a Sea Org member. I'm one of the most ethical beings on the planet. And you can't trust me to have a, a talkie device? Like what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Right? <laughs> and it That's came sweet. down to – I didn't realize the order was coming from RTC. I thought the order was just coming from some asshole in senior HCO. And so mm-hmm. I'd just tell him to F off. And until, until the night before Sea Org Day, mm-hmm. the senior Dur INR, Tiana Lake, came to me begging me, which is weird because I'm an ASHO Sea Org member. She's senior HCO. She shouldn't be begging me for anything, right? Yeah, yeah. I, under orders of RTC, am not allowed to go to Sea Org Day until you give me your phone. Will Aww. you please give me your phone? I'll mm-hmm. give it back to you after Sea Org Day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's awesome. They would do that though all the time. Like it would be like, like even with your auditor, it would be like, please, I will get in trouble if you don't answer this question. That's how they controlled you with everything. Like even when I would say, no, I'm not going to turn the music off. Like I remember at that time, the girl, like when they w- wouldn't allow us to play music in the office. And I was like, well, that's not right. What policy says we can't listen to music? I remember when I called that girl out, she was like, come with me to the other room. And she was like, you're right. She was like, that's just the rules. And I don't know why it's the rule. It wasn't like that when I was at flag. So you're right. But maybe you just shouldn't call me out in front of everybody. So it was just like interesting. Like then I was like, didn't give her as hard of a time because I felt bad for her personally that she was in that situation. I mean, so many times. That's what I did. I felt bad for somebody because of the trouble they would get into for not handling me. Yeah. Do you remember at Flag, the DFT, Sean Smith? Mm-hmm. And Sean Smith is a woman for everyone's information. Yeah. I remember her explaining it to, honestly, a room full of out-of-org trainees that when orders come down from on high, it's like it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It's like electricity. The only, the only way you can get hurt is to not pass it on. Hmm. And it was and it was almost like, so you pass it on, be, you, you pass on whatever it is, whether you agree with it or not, mm-hmm. because the result of not passing it on is you're the one who gets shocked. And right. mm-hmm. if you want to survive, you pass the shit on. That's right. And I'm like, what a weird so thing true. for a Sea Org executive to be telling to a bunch of people, you know, like it was just it, at the time it yeah. seemed weird, but it's also completely true. Yeah, she's like smart for making that analysis to herself, learning how to survive, I guess. Yeah. But also it's messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. SPTV Tattoo Warrior. 
Did you know that when you listen to your book on 1.5 speed, it sounds like you reading it? <laughs> I wonder. No, if, I didn't. <laughs> are you not the one who reads your book? No, I don't. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Like, wouldn't it sound like her on normal speed? <laughs> That's funny, though. Yeah. Oh. I have, like, listened to it, like, a little bit of it. And I think the girl sounds great, but I'm like, it's like, who is this person pretending to be me? Does it, does it seem to you that they tried to find someone who sounded like you? I think they tried to find somebody who like sounded young because I was like young at the time. And I was young in many of the experiences in the book, not young anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think they tried to maybe find somebody who could sound like a kid thing. Teresa Stupiello, Stupiello, what is life like for you now? And what is the most surprising thing about living in the real world outside of a cult? Um, I think the most surprising thing was that like people who are not Scientologists are really nice and friendly and um, kind. I mean, obviously not everybody, but that was the most surprising thing to me. And it's something that I noticed immediately that they were just like me and just like my friends in Scientology, but nicer because you didn't like get gaslit on every single complaint you had, you know, they'd be like shocked at the bad things that happened to you instead of act asking you what you did to deserve it. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Just a couple more here and then we'll wrap it up. Carl says, um, did you ever witness, all right, is this, I'm just going to read it as it's written. Was you ever witness to the Hubbard Miscavige arguments about who ruined Scientology the most? Um, Alan Hubbard died when I was two, so I never met him. So no. Um, yeah. And. <clears throat> oh, but he, I guess he doesn't mean between Hubbard and David Miscavige. I think he means people talk about it all the time like and yes i have been part of those discussions like what is scientology bad because of hubbard or did my uncle just make it bad i know people um talk about that to some extent i'm i can't i can't imagine that's what this is referring to but i wonder if he's talking about things that miscavige has said about like ray midoff is to blame because ray midoff forgot what elvin hubbard said OT9 and 10 were supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Mike Rinders told that story. Uh, Dave would be like, can you believe this mf -er? He forgot what's supposed to be on the OT levels. <laughs> <laughs> we sold them for many years, but. <laughs> I honestly don't know what this question means. So um, I think, it, I think that what he's talking about is that is what I said that people, some people think that L. Ron Hubbard's Scientology was all nice and fine and things were much more pleasant and that Dave made it really bad and extra and that sort of thing. So I've definitely partaken in those, but my opinion is that it's just both of them. It's not true that everything was great under Hubbard and Dave made everything bad. They're both bad. Oh, sure. and well, and if anybody bad. truly thinks that they should be an independent Scientologist, like if Scientology was great under L. Ron Hubbard, then you should still be in it. You should be an independent Scientologist, I guess. Um, yeah, true. But uh, yeah. Okay. Anti Harju. Jenna, what's your favorite football team on this planet? I don't. I, I guess we don't know if that means football or soccer. Oh. Do you follow either? Was... No. I yeah. suck at sports. <laughs> That's In what Sterling way. says too. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He got all of whatever that is. I, I'm tra traumatized for life in sports that's why i don't like it because i had to what? play on teams with all these like 15 year old boys when i was six so now i basically i hate sports <laughs> so so as a kid you never you so you don't have any fond um athletic memories like you didn't like soccer or i don't know field hockey. No. i mean field hockey i don't they don't do that at the um they did actually <clears throat> do it like we had 45 minutes a day where it was pe but we would do like 
physical fitness tests. Like we would like run a mile and then we'd have to do all these push-ups and sit-ups. And there was like a guy there that would like make sure we did them right. And then they would like, yeah, we like they would have sports, but I would just like stand on the side and do cartwheels. I just like did not participate. <laughs> um, for some reason, I was just scrolling through and saw a comment that reminded me of this. Um, my uh, my famous ongoing hatred for Ben Monahan. Did you know Ben Monahan at and when you were at middle management? Yeah, I didn't like know him well, but I know who he is. Did you ever and have I, to deal with him? Not like directly. Like I've definitely spoken to him many times, but. Yeah. Well, if he's not trying to flirt or sexually assault someone, he's usually just <laughs> screaming or yelling. <laughs> it's true. I think I got the other end of his um, flirting and sexual, not actually, but yeah, that's yeah. the part that I saw. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. What a piece of shit. All right. <laughs> I thought there was another question. Um, it couldn't have been that important. Um, but anyway, that, that, that pretty much is, uh, that's our time folks. We did that. That didn't feel like two hours, did it? No, not at all. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. <laughs> um, all right. Next time you'll have to practice, uh, working on the comments on your own. Oops. Stephanie Sandoval with a super sticker oh. right under, right under the wire. Very kind oh. Stephanie. Oh my God. Another one right under the wire. People don't want us to stop. Um, Chelsea Sharp says, Jenna, just want to say how much I love watching you guys. I'm from Essex in the UK and I follow everything you both do. Well done to you both for letting us wogs know how bad this cult really is. <laughs> Thank you. I love when non-Scientologists use that word. Oh, hey, I, I did get an email from someone about this word wog saying that they think L. Ron Hubbard took the word from the Navy. There's a word polywog, which not to be confused with gollywog. Okay. Polywog, which is shortened to wog. And it's any sailor who has not crossed the equator. And oh. it's considered a big deal in the Navy when you go from being a wog to being w whatever you are when you're no longer a wog. Um, I'm not convinced that's where L. Ron Hubbard got it from. Yeah, I don't know, but though. I, I feel like it's so weird that we don't know. Like, of all the word clearing we did, like, how could we have gone past this one? I know. Do you remember? Do you remember when, if you ever had to look that definition up and seeing that it said "worthy Oriental gentleman" and wondering how the hell that could be the definition of wog? Yeah, or like also, I also saw "well and orderly gentleman," and I was like, "What does that have to do with what this word really means?" Right. Like it was just confusing. Do you remember trying to ask someone to explain it? Hello, that's verbal data. You can't do that. I know. <laughs> It's one of the most common words in Scientology and nobody will explain why the dictionary in Scientology says what it says. It's yeah. No, I, I never thought of that. That's a good point though. It doesn't <laughs> make any sense. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that's our time. Thank you. So, I mean, we're watching on Jenna's channel only. So if you're watching, um, uh, check that subscribe button. If you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. And, um, Thanks. Uh, I guess, do you want me to do my little Brisbane outro on this? Because otherwise we don't have, I don't have another outro. Yeah, do it. I'll use the Brisbane Adorable. outro. All right. <laughs> thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to everyone who watches until the very end. And we'll thank talk to you, you everybody. Okay. If you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click what's inside here if you have six squares or not sit square right here Bye.